is migration narrated across different media? How do media changes affect the ways people move across borders and tell us stories about migration? I am Nafisa Musavi, lecturer in comparative literature, and in the next few minutes I will talk with you about migration in, with and across media. Migration has many faces. There are various types of migration and diverse types of migrants that are distinguished, among others, by their level of access to financial, political and cultural capitals. Migration is movement, but is also getting stuck, as happens, for example, with long periods of indefinite waiting for refugees in camps and detention centres. Migration sets the survival drives into motion and for many is experienced as a crisis. It is a crisis which is experienced bodily and physically as people are displaced, so often against their will, and are transplanted in unfamiliar contexts. But it is also a crisis in communication as the migrants leave their already established contacts and resources for communication and need to start anew. The new beginning should most often happen in a language and a culture which appears more different than similar to what they have been socialized into. That is why I'd like to say migration is a semiotic crisis experienced at the somatic level. When looking at narratives of migration in novels, short stories, graphic novels and films, I try to study them by maintaining this multidimensional view by looking at what these narratives are telling about migration, but also how they have been created across borders. Migration and media can be linked together in so many ways. We do hear a lot of talk about migration in media. Migration is an ever-present topic represented in different media, and increasingly so. We also witness migration with media. Different media shape the journeys of migrants. Media of memory, like family photos, are taken by migrants to establish a link between their life before and after migration. Technical media, like cell phones, are used as significant tools for navigation, communication and survival in the difficult journeys refugees have to take across various borders. Social media are used by migrants and activists for narrating stories of migration and reaching for more voice and visibility. And these are just a few hasty examples. Migration has also been a very popular metaphor for any sort of actual or virtual mobility across borders. We talk about migration of stories from literature to other media like film, or migration of stories, thoughts and values across borders of nations and in between different cultures. Though in the metaphorical sense, migration seems to be a much less difficult journey, more like a free bird would fly from this branch to the other. These metaphors tell us a lot about how we think about migration. Migrant authors have been telling the stories about migration for decades in different media, and it is now no news to talk about migration literature or cinema or art. Migrant authors are indeed somewhat expected to do so, as the label of migrant is actually a very sticky one. It positions the author between cultures and keeps them somewhat at an outsider position to the cultures they are addressing. While there have been a lot of work done about what these authors are telling us about migration, I think we still need to look into how these authors are handling the crisis of communication and what, what their strategies are to survive across borders. I want to introduce one of these multidimensional strategies that I choose to call migratory self-adaptation. By self-adaptation, I refer to the process and products of artistic experiences in which a work is adapted into another media by the same author. Makes sense, doesn't it? Migratory self-adaptation is then simply self-adaptation performed by a migrant author and in context of migration. But what does that really mean? 
Because of the heavy weight of the life experience and the autobiography of the author and the movements across cultures, in migratory self-adaptation, specific processes emerge that distinguish it from other types of non-migratory adaptation or self-adaptation. Migratory self-adaptation involves migration, self, and adaptation. Adaptation emerges here with almost all its connotations, adapting to a new medium, adapting to a new environment, adaptation of traumas, adaptation of one's way of being. Migratory self-adaptation needs to gather various processes that accompany migration, memory and remembering, translation and language difference, and moving across borders. It entails repeating a story and an authorship across different media and cultures. But repetition is not only sameness. Every repetition involves change and emergence of new characteristics and ideas. And that is what happens in the work of authors who adapt their own work across several borders. Let's get more familiar with this process by looking at works of two authors who have performed it. Authors for whom migration has not stopped at the geographical level, but continues to shape their artistic work. Marjan Satrapi and Atir Rahimi are two migrant authors who have repeatedly adapted their own works. Satrapi is an Iranian French artist, graphic novelist, and filmmaker, and Atir Rahimi is an Afghan French novelist, filmmaker, and poet. I will focus only on one work of each, Satrapi's Persepolis and Rahimi's The Patience Stone or Sangha Sabur, both of which remain to be the best known works of these authors to this date. Satrapi published the graphic novel Persepolis in France, first gradually between 2000 and 2003. In 2008, she, with Vincent Parroneur, another comics artist, co-directed an adaptation of the book into a hand-drawn animated feature film with a mainly French crew of artists and artisans. Persepolis was Satrapi's first self-adaptation, but was followed with another case a few years later when she and Parroneur directed a live-action plus animation of her later graphic novel, Chicken with Plums. Rahimi published Sangha Sabur in 2007 as his first translingually written French novel. Prior to this book, he had published novels and made films in his mother tongue, Dari Persian. But it was with Sangha Sabur that he won the Prix Goncourt, the most prestigious French literary prize, and became an international figure, both for Afghan literature and the Francophone literature. Rahimi directed a film adaptation of his own novel in 2012 with a transnational crew coming from France, Afghanistan, Iran, Morocco and elsewhere. Sangha Sabu was actually the second self-adaptation of Rahimi. Before that, he had also adapted his novel Earth and Ashes into a film, that time with the mainly Afghan and Iranian co-authors and collaborators. I guess you should have already smelled the numerous cultural, geographical and media journeys happening here. But let's take a closer look at these journeys. Persepolis is an autobiographical graphic novel telling the life story of Marjan from childhood to adulthood. The narrative simultaneously gives a personal account of the contemporary history of Iran from slightly before the Islamic Revolution throughout the years of Iran-Iraq war and the ongoing political oppression. It also portrays Marjan's experience of migration in her adult sons. The story ends at the point where the author narrator character sets out for a second definite migration to France. A migration which plays the prelude for the creation of Persepolis in the quite western medium of comics and at the heart of the French tradition of graphic narration. By becoming film, Persepolis could enjoy a vaster and different audience and even reach Iran much more vigorously than the book could do. While there were only whispers about the book, the film created blasts and even stood official reactions from the Iranian state who accused this counter-memory of falsehood and blackwashing. I usually say that by becoming film, Persepolis began to touch borders with the official media territory of the Iranian state that, more than any media, is constructed of films with international presence. It is not only the political repercussions of the adaptation that make the media change important here. When we look at Persepolis as a graphic novel, 
and also as an animated movie, we see how the film is not only a redoing of the book, but also an expansion of the memories and the autobiographical process in new modes and capacities. The two versions of Persepolis are great examples for looking at how we remember differently with different media and how we need a different basic media like text, image and sound to remember and give shape to our memories. The journey is quite different for Sanga Sabur. It starts with a French novel with a visible taste of French cinematic writing and a tradition of nouveau roman. The novel tells the story of an unnamed Afghan woman who is taking care of the semi-dead body of her despotic, combatant husband. The woman fearfully begins to talk with the body and in no time the talk evolves into a process of self-discovery, identity creation and, again, remembering. With the film, the narrative does actually go back to its geography of origination, like Persepolis did, but in a different way. The film is actually a translation back to Persian, Dari. It travels back to Afghanistan partly in its depiction of a space and becomes more accessible for the local audiences by surpassing the issues of literacy and distribution to some extent. The problem of access is not though solved altogether for neither of the films as none of them could get official and broader screenings in their respective countries. By adapting their books into films and remaining there as the author of all versions, both Satrapi and Rahimi have performed a repetitive authorship which changes with every media. They have shared the creative process with numerous co-authors by moving from more solitary work of writing and drawing to the extremely collaborative work of movie making. They have oscillated between their languages and have created in translation while moving across media and cultures. And they have been able to speak to more diverse commun communities of audiences. That is probably an issue with being a migrant. You have to say everything at least twice. Either you are not heard or understood or you need to orient yourself towards opposing directions. But Satrapi and Rahimi are among the lucky ones who have had access to various modes of communication as well as diverse sets of audiences. That is not the case for many displaced individuals. I would like to finish this presentation by emphasizing the importance of access to media and semiotic resources and the hardships various people experience in communication due to existing inequalities in access to media. Perhaps we should begin thinking about the right to media and communication as an essential human right.